Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Natalia Linos, and I'm the executive director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. And I am lucky enough to be kicking off our first panel. Um, I myself am a social epidemiologist who looks at patterns of disease distribution. And at the outset, I want to be clear that the way that I look at and you know, social epidemiologists look at health inequities that are by race is that we know that this isn't because of biology. The patterns that we are seeing is because of structural racism. So we are taking that as a foundational um, you know, knowledge, but we will explain more in the Q&A. We have a fantastic panel this morning. We have four presenters and I'll be introducing each one of them in the order that they'll be speaking. Um, they will talk about the potential of AI to advance equity, but also the potential biases and drawbacks that we need to be aware of as we introduce new technologies. They will each speak for about 10 to 15 minutes making their presentations and then we'll have a conversation. So if you have questions, use the Q&A function and, and ask them and we will try to get to as many of them. So our first speaker is Dr. Sherelle Barber. She is a social epidemiologist whose research focuses on the intersection of place, race and health and examines the role of structural racism in shaping health inequities. Dr. Barber is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and the Urban Health Collabor Collaborative at Drexel University's Dornsife School of Public Health. She also serves as chair of the planning committee charged to establish a center on racism and health, which will launch there in 2021. Her research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the American Heart Association. And as a scholar activist, Dr. Barber is committed to using her scholarship to make the invisible visible, mobilize data for action, and during this COVID pandemic, established an advisory committee to the Poor People's Campaign, providing justice-centered public health expertise for the, movement, for the movement. I'm going to introduce everyone right now so that then we don't have the interruptions between the speakers. So Dr. Barber, allow me to introduce the others. You can all go to their bios. I am pulling out excerpts. It sounds like these are long, but these are really accomplished, amazing professionals you have today. Our next speaker will be Dr. Karthik Sivashankar, who's a psychiatrist and the medical director of quality, safety, and equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and who also serves as vice president of the American Medical Association for Equitable Health Systems and Innovation. As medical director for quality, safety, and equity, he has led efforts to ensure racial equity considerations are embedded in quality and safety procedures. By operationalizing these efforts, making them part of everyday tasks, such as through reporting, Dr. Sivashankar is working to dismantle healthcare inequities and their associated risks at both the individual and systemic level. And Dr. Sivashankar also serves as the PI of a quality improvement initiative to enhance the screening and transfer process for patients seeking substance detoxification. Our third speaker uh, is Dr. Amaka Inanya, and she's an attending nephrologist and assistant professor of medicine and epidemiologist at the University of Pennsylvania. She is also the Director of Health Equity, Anti-Racism, and Community Engagement in the Nephrology Division. Uh, Dr. Inanya is a clinical investigator with research interests at Center in Palliative Care, Informed Decision-Making and Health Equity Among Patients with Advanced Chronic Kidney Disease and End-Stage Kidney Disease. Her work has been supported by the National, National Institutes of Health and the American Society of Nephrology. She's also passionate about promoting diversity within academia, as well as pursuing educational and outreach opportunities through traditional and social media. And last but not least is Dr. Ziad Ob Obermeyer, who trained as an emergency doctor, and he still gets away often, um, as often as he can to a hospital in rural Arizona to do what he loves, which is work in the ER. But these days, Ziad spends most of his time doing research and teaching at UC Berkeley. Inspired by his clinical work, he builds machine learning algorithms to help doctors make better decisions. He also studies where algorithms can go wrong and how they can reproduce and even scale up racial bias and how to fix them when they do. This work has received many awards from the National Academy of Medicine, the NIH, the medical societies, and has been published in a wide range of journals from science to the New England Journal of Medicine and computer science conferences. So as you've heard, we have an amazing panel. I will stop talking here and pass it on to Dr. Barber for her presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barber. Thank you, Natalia. So uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm going to preface my, uh, my, my remarks by saying um, I probably am a bit of a skeptic and will be providing some 
overview remarks about how I think about uh, one racial, especially racial health inequities and what some considerations for these broad structural and systemic uh, issues might be. And so as a social epidemiologist, I study the links between structural racism and health inequities. And today I wanna actually offer three points of consideration and four questions for reflection as we think about applications of AI for the advancement of health equity. And so the first uh, is that inequities, as we know in health, particularly racial inequities in health in the United States are large, persistent, and are observed across multiple disease outcomes here in this country. For example, this slide shows black white mortality rate inequities over time. And although these inequities have um, uh, decreased over time, they have remained uh, pretty persistent since the beginning of the 1900s. Moreover, of the 15 leading causes of death, black Americans have higher death rates in nine of them, including heart disease, diabetes, cancer, stroke, homicide, kidney disease, hypertension, septicemia, and liver disease. Um, in addition, we know that over the past year, racial inequities in health have been brought into sharp focus with Black American and other marginalized racial groups being disproportionately impacted, for example, by the COVID-19 pandemic. According to available data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Black Americans and other marginalized racial groups have higher rates of reported cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. But not only are these groups, uh, have they been more likely to contract and die from the disease, analysis from the Harvard Population Center have also documented age-specific mortality rates by race and found that Black Americans, for example, between the ages of 25 and 34, died at a rate seven times that of white Americans in the same age group, while Black Americans between the ages of 35 and 44 died at a rate of nine times that of white Americans. And then finally, um, unfortunately, what we've seen over the last, um, the, uh, in a recent report by the CDC is that there has been a residual impact of the pandemic, which has led to a decline in life expectancy across all racial groups, but has been most pronounced and most striking among Black and Hispanic Americans, with Black men losing three years of life between 2019 and 2020. So these, these inequities that we're trying to or attempting to address are, are large, are striking, and persistent. And I think that's one consideration we must have as we're thinking about applications for AI. The next is that the drivers of these persistent and striking inequities are not biological or genetic in origin, but rather are the byproduct of structural racism and other systems of oppression in our society many of which occur prior to one's encounter with the healthcare system. And so this timeline developed by Dr. Shanita Je Seeley Jefferson, chair elect of the epidemiology section for APHA was published in 2020 and provides necessary and timely perspective on how racism is our country's underlying pre-existing condition and that settler colonialism resulting in the genocide of indigenous peoples and the institution of slavery that extracted millions of West and Central Africans from, other, uh, from their countries, forcing them into generations of free labor, formed the very foundation upon which this country was built and cannot be ignored in conversations about health inequities. And beyond slavery, we know that structural racism operates vis-a-vis -vis systems, racist policies in particular. And I just call your attention to this recently published New England Journal, New England Journal of Medicine um, article, um, lead author Dr. Zinzi Bailey, that outlines how systemic racism shows up in racial residential self segregation the healthcare system, as well as mass incarceration in this country to produce and reproduce the racial inequities that we see. Um, in an attempt uh, to really understand how this was operating during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, colleagues and I um, have put together a conceptual model really thinking about how racism operates vis-a-vis -vis, uh, historically salient systems and structures that create, maintain, and perpetuate racial hierarchy and racial inequities through racist ideologies, racist policies, racist politics, and racial violence. And these structures produce what we often refer to as the social and structural determinants of health, 
um, and ultimately lead to racial inequities. And here we have referenced COVID-19, but again, this can be um, applied to a wide range of health outcomes. One of the, the other uh, characteristics of this particular conceptual model is that these systems are interlocking and they act synergistically to produce these inequities. And again, I think it's really important that we think about the complexity of how racial inequities come to be um, as, as we think about what um, AI has to offer in addressing these inequities. And then one final consideration actually comes from work that I do around the role of racial residential segregation as a fundamental cause of health inequities. It is one of the most visible manifestations of structural racism in this country and um, has often been considered fundamental to our understanding of inequities. Uh, for example, there's uh, work that has uh, shown that your zip code is more important than your genetic code in determining life expectancy. And here in Philadelphia, where I, I currently live, there's upwards of a 20 year life expectancy difference between poor black neighborhoods and more affluent white neighborhoods in the city. Um, we know that racial residential segregation here in the country is not by accident, but by design, and that it can be traced back to redlining policies of the 1930s, which really set the stage for decades of systematic disinvestment in black communities across the country. Hundreds of maps were created for cities that color-coded neighborhoods to guide banks in making investments. And red line neighborhoods, for example, were deemed hazardous and most often were the places where Black and immigrant uh, uh, populations re resided. The case of redlining is particularly salient as we think about AI. In some regards, it was merely an application of the big data of its day in the form of maps of hundreds of cities across the country that reinforced and solidified what already existed. We also know that redlining was um, uh, solidified um, by racist practices such as restrictive covenants, which limited the residential mobility and wealth accumulation of Black Americans. And these uh, covenants were often upheld by racial violence which serve to reinforce these racist policies and practices. And while we did have the victory of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, uh, which was designed to address these racist policies, unfortunately, we know that racially segregated communities to this day are still plagued by a host of adverse conditions that combine to lead to lower life expectancy, higher rates of disease, and higher rates of death. Um, and I, you know, again, highlight these issues to again, just reinforce the idea that the racial inequities that we're trying to address using AI are deep. They're deeply embedded in the societal, our societal structure and have to be addressed if we're really going to address health inequities. And then finally, I'll just uh, draw your attention to some work that I did with colleagues around the pandemic where we have been tracking uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 outcomes across zip codes in Philadelphia. And so we thought about this from a historical perspective, looking at redlining maps of, from the 1930s, and then created maps that also looked at current day levels of segregation, and then uh, created indicate, a, a map of indicators that showed, uh, of, of census data that showed where, um, neighborhoods were particularly susceptible to COVID-19, both the uh, transmission as well as death. And what we found is that in North Philadelphia, um, which is a formerly red line uh, neighborhood, high levels of segregation and high levels of uh, uh, structural susceptibility were, were correlated. Um, and then also in West Philadelphia, we also found that formerly red lines uh, partially redlined neighborhoods uh, are, uh, that were current that are currently segregated also had high levels of structural susceptibility. Again, this legacy being shown through the data from COVID-19. And then just as a um, looking at the cases early on in the pandemic, we found a twofold difference in COVID-19 outcomes um, uh, when you compare the most segregated zip codes in Philadelphia to the least segregated zip codes. Again, reinforcing this idea that these structural issues really are the major drivers of health inequities. And so in closing, I would just ask us to reflect on these four questions that I've been thinking about as I thought about or prepared for this conference. And that is, how does AI take into account 
the centuries of racism, white supremacy, and other forms of structural oppression that are the fundamental drivers of health inequities inside and outside the healthcare system is the artificial intelligence incorporated into emerging applications of AI rooted in the very real and systemic intelligence of the racist society in which we all live? How do we avoid the tendency towards high tech solutions that often replace high touch solutions needed to overcome entrenched inequities? And then finally, how do the voices and lived experiences of those most harmed by systems of oppression become operationalized in the application of AI within healthcare. Um, um, if we don't consider seriously these issues or contend with these issues, then AI may simply become another tool in the master's tool belt that maintains rather than dismantles the master's house. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Barber. And it's really wonderful to start us off on a day of conversation on AI um, and health equity thinking about the history and, and really delving deep. And so thank you for that. And I hope we will get to those questions during our conversation. Next up is uh, Dr. Inanya. Yes, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Um, thank you for the invitation to present today on a topic that's gained so much national and international attention, and that's the use of race in EGFR equations, which we use to diagnose and manage kidney disease. So objectives of this talk will include to um, will include reviewing the history of estimating glomerular filtration rate equations, and then moving on to describe the pitfalls of using race in uh, estimating glomerular filtration rate equations, otherwise known as EGFR. So. Assessment of someone's GFR is essential to determining a person's kidney function. And eGFR equations allow for the indirect assessment of GFR using endogenous filtration biomarkers that we all have in our bodies, such as creatinine, cystatin C, without the need for urinary cl clearance measurements. And there's some variables that have been associated with these endogenous filtration markers that cannot be easily measured. And these would be things that we call non-GFR determinants, which include the generation and tubular filtration and secretion of those biomarkers. And then there's also demographic and clinical variables that are associated with these filtration markers that we, um, again, know uh, have, have some influence. And so essentially eGFR equations are multivariable linear regression models that relate observed GFR to observed serum concentrations of these filtration markers and also account for these demographic and clinical variables. So let's do a deep dive into the first eGFR equation study that was published in the United States by Dr. Andrew Levy and his group. Um, and this would be the modification of diet and renal disease study. So the NDRD study was actually a prospective clinical trial that uh, was being performed to assess the impact of dietary protein restriction on the progression of uh, renal disease. And in that study, all of the participants had GFR measured by iiothalamate, which is an exogenous filtration marker, which is our gold standard for measuring kidney function. And stepwise multiple regression was used to determine a set of variables that together best predicted GFR. And you can see here the list of variables that were considered for possible inclusion in this regression model, which included weight, height, sex, ethnicity, which we now know was race, and a number of other clinical variables. So here is kind of the meat of what they found in the study. You can see here on the x-axis, there's GFR. And on the y-axis, we have serum creatinine concentration. The solid line represents black individuals in the study and the dashed line represents white individuals. And you can see here at any measured level, at any level of measured GFR, black individuals had higher serum creatinine concentrations compared to white individuals. And they found this both for women and men. And so to facilitate the clinical interpretation, the results were re-expressed in terms of regression coefficients that refer to change in geometric mean GFR associated with the unit changes in the independent variable. And they tested multiple equations. And in this uh, MDRD study, six variables together jointly predicted GFR best. And that those were serum creatinine concentration, age, serum urea nitrogen concentration, serum albumin, sex, and black ethnicity or black race. 
And you can see here the regression coefficients or the multiplication factors that are associated with these variables. So for female sex, it's 0 0.76 and for black race, it's 1.18, which means that a black person would have 18% higher EGFR compared to another any other racial group using this multiplication factor. And so this was like a win for nephrology, right? They had this equation that had used our gold standard of measuring kidney function iothalamate um, to predict uh, kidney function. Uh, it was using serum creatinine, which had been widely accepted in US clinical laboratories at this point, it had been standardized. And the demographic data that they would impute into the uh, equation was already available in medical charts. And so this was like, a, again, a big win for us about what we can really assess accurately someone's kidney function. And I do want to note that at the time, the authors thought that including a black race specific coefficient was actually a strength because they acknowledged that that black uh, individuals um, were diagnosed more frequently with chronic kidney disease, which is still true to this day. And they thought that this would be a, a better way to even uh, to assess kidney disease among black individuals. So if it was such a huge win um, and, and you know, a great thing for our field, then why is it being heavily challenged to this day? Well, first, there was a lack of racial diversity. So among the 1,600 individuals that had measured iothalamate, there were only 197 Black patients, so 12% of the cohort, a minority of the study cohort. And then this is the biggest challenge of the study. Uh, what the authors, uh, why the authors assumed that they saw differences between blacks and whites compared uh, in terms of serum creatinine levels. So here it's quoted, previous studies have shown that on average, black persons have greater muscle mass compared to white persons. And they supported this assertion with three very small studies that had been published between the 1970s and 1990s. And I'll review them quickly for you. The first was a body composition study within a pediatric population. So among 240 or so children, they found that black children had less body fat compared to white children. The next study was a body chemical composition study among 47 adults, where they found that compared to age and sex matched white participants, black participants had higher total body potassium and, and calcium. And then this last study was a study of uh, 60 healthy hospital workers, where they found that uh, among that black participants had higher serum creatine kinase levels compared to white participants. And these were the just this was what was used to justify the notion that black individuals had greater, greater muscle mass. Just as an aside, you can't measure muscle mass on any person. Um, and so studies that have looked at muscle mass have used either body chemical composition studies or imaging studies to estimate uh, uh, muscle mass. And to this day, there have been no studies to definitively prove that black individuals either domestically or internationally have greater muscle mass than all other racial groups. And so the, uh, the, the evolution of EGFR equations are as follows. So after the six variable, six variable MDRD equation was published, the four variable equation was published because the authors um, published an abstract where they narrowed the variables to age, sex, gender, and serum creatinine, uh, black race, age, and uh, sex, and serum creatinine level. And the black race coefficient for this study was 1.21, so slightly higher than the six variable equation. And then the 10 years later, the CKD epi study was published, which had a significantly larger cohort of patients, more black patients in this study, about 31% of the population. And the black race coefficient uh, for this study was 1.16. They found the same associations with black individuals having higher serum creatinine levels compared to white individuals. And then in 2012, the authors validated the CKD epi equation using cystatin C, again, another endogenous uh, biomark filtration marker. And they found that there were no racial differences between participants. And so, therefore, no black race coefficient was needed. However, when they combined both biomarkers, uh, which they found to be the more accurate equation compared to either biomarker alone, there was a significant difference between racial groups and the black race coefficient was 1.08 in this study. I do wanna you know, take a quick pause to talk about the performance of EGFR equations. 
And so uh, I want to bring your attention to this, uh, this statistic P30. So P30 refers to the proportion of EGFR estimates that fall within 30% of measured GFR. So you can see here the comparison between CKD epi and MDRD. The CKD epi equation performs better than the MDRD study equation. However, you can see that it's not 100%. And so EGFR is just that, an estimate. It is not a hard and fast cell on anyone's kidney function. And you can also see here that the P30 increases as you move on, on the higher end of the GFR spectrum, and it decreases as you move toward the lower end of the GFR spectrum, which is where we make our clinical decisions. And so with that being said, if we're thinking about the margin of error that surrounds GFR, then if we really want to compare Black Americans versus non-Black Americans, this is a nice graph that shows that. So for in the red dot, you can see um, an individual's uh, creatinine level and the margin of error that surrounds it with these confidence intervals for EGFR compared to a non-Black individual um, that's represented in green. And you can see here that the confidence intervals, uh, intervals for these measurements overlap significantly, much larger than the 16% difference than the EGFR, that the EGFR race coefficient brings between Blacks and non-Blacks. So let's move on to, to briefly speaking about the consequences of using race and EGFR equations. So one, there's significant bias in nephrology. And I'll, I'll start with just describing explicit bias, which are conscious and controlled acts we are left to judge a patient's physical phenotypic appearance to determine which EGFR calculation to use. Most health systems report a black EGFR value versus a non-black EGFR value. That is explicit bias. And then the implicit bias is us thinking that black individuals are inherently different. So we've been taught for decades that black individuals have greater muscle mass than all other racial groups. It's unclear how that affects clinical care, but if you do a quick thesaurus search for uh, muscular, you'll find athletic, brawny, sturdy. What does that do in terms of our management of black individuals at risk of or having kidney disease? There've been studies to show that implicit bias has been associated with poor outcomes among black individuals, specifically in the United States. And again, this has not been proven, but you can imagine that it's not good because again, this is a false belief about biological differences between blacks and other groups, other racial groups. So if we're using uh, the race coefficient to assign black individuals better kidney function or a higher EGFR value, that can result in a delay in care. So our current guidelines by KDGO recommend that we refer for nephrology special, specialty care when the GFR, or as most clinicians don't have access to GFR, they use EGFR, is less than 30. And we refer for kidney transplant evaluation when the GFR is close to 20 and patients can actually gain official waitlist time when when their, EG, when their EGFR is equal to or less than 20. We already know that there's significant racial disparities that exist with both of these. So black individuals are less likely to see nephrologists before they need dialysis. They're also significantly less likely to receive kidney transplantation compared to all other racial groups. We know that for a fact that's been happening for decades. There's also a delay in referral for kidney failure care. We have to educate patients about which modality that they would be most consistent with their goals and values, whether that be a home modality, in-center dialysis, or no dialysis. Um, and so we're delaying this for patients if, if we assign them better kidney function. And Black individuals are less likely to receive home dialysis modalities, which we know are associated with better quality of life and physical functioning. Um, vascular access creation is another disparity. Black individuals are more likely to start dialysis with catheters, which are less ideal than fistulas. Fistulas need eight to 12 weeks to heal once they've been surgically created. Again, we are delaying patients um, because we're assigning them better kidney function to have this, this critical kidney failure care. Uh, we can have improper dosing of pharmacologic treatments. Black patients can have higher doses of pharmacologic treatments based on this better kidney function. We have no accommodation for patients of mixed race and ethnicity. I recently spoke to a woman who was biracial. She had one white parent and one black parent, phenotypically looked black and identified as a black woman. She had advanced kidney failure and she asked could she use her white side to be listed earlier and they did. And she was well within her right because we don't have an accommodation for, for patients like her.
And we also have a lack of transparency with patients during shared decision making. This is where most of my research falls. Having, uh, making decisions about a patient's clinical care, their pathway based on whether they're black versus non-black is a violation of transparency, which is a central principle of shared decision making. So in conclusion, the use of black race and EGFR equations incorrectly assumes that black individuals are inherently different than other racial groups. And the pitfalls of using race and EGFR equations include delays in access to nephrology care, implicit bias, and a lack of transparency when discussing treatment options with patients at risk or with kidney disease. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Inanya. That's, it's really fascinating to delve into one case example and to see the implications. And you know, we as uh, practitioners committed to health equity want to be using technology to mitigate uh, existing inequities. And what you have shown us is not only are we not mitigating the existing ones, we are reinforcing them through our, our decision-making. So with that, I want to call um, Dr. Ziad uh, Obermeyer to present his work, um, which similarly, I think, can show some of these pitfalls. Dr. Obermeyer. All right, thank you so much. Um, let me just make sure that my screen is, there we go. Um, so I um, wanna pick up on some of the themes um, that the previous speakers brought up and apply them to one case study. Um, and the case study I wanna talk about is around targeting resources, which is you know um, uh, well before COVID, but, but especially during COVID, um, such an important topic for public policy and an area where algorithms are being used more and more. So targeting is at its core, a particular kind of um, uh, problem. So we can frame it in a statistical way as saying, okay, I observe a number of people, whether they're patients in a clinic, um, counties in a country, um, hospitals, um, I observe some data about them and I have some resources that I need to allocate. And so I need to figure out which of those units um, needs help and allocate my resources according um, to my measure of help. And so algorithms turn out to be incredibly useful for this type of statistical problem, um, and they're being increasingly used for those problems. Um, but along the way, in trying to solve those problems, algorithms can also reproduce, and in some cases, even scale up um, the racial biases in the data that they learn from. And I think that was one of the many themes that um, both of our previous speakers alluded to. So I want to focus on a part of the algorithm that I think is a really underappreciated, but a really important driver of that bias. And it's the specific variable that that algorithm is trained to predict, the target variable. Um, what what the algorithm is learning. And I, I think of that, and I wanna to try to persuade you to think of that as the way that we embody our values and our principles in training the algorithm. All of it comes through that variable um, that we teach it to learn from. So the case study that I wanna just walk through very quickly um, comes from a, a paper that we published a couple of years ago in science, and it's around how hospitals target their extra help for complex patients. So. Um, anyone who's interested in healthcare or who's encountered the healthcare system knows that um, there's a small number of complex and chronically ill patients um, who are receiving poor fragmented care. They bounce between specialists, between the hospital and home, um, and along the way, they generate um, extremely high costs. So this is a bad situation that's caught lots of people's attention. And if you look at what hospital systems are doing about it, um, by and large, they're investing in what are called high-risk care management program, care coordination programs. Basically, they are, you know, I think of them as um, VIP programs for these very, very sick, complex patients. They have a dedicated phone number that they can call at any time. They have set aside primary care slots. So it's really like trying to get these people the extra help they need, um, both to help them with their health problems and, and nip problems in the bud, um, but also, of course, downstream to save costs for the healthcare system. Um, now, as you can imagine, having that dedicated phone line staffed by nurse practitioners, home visits, et cetera, all that stuff is expensive. And so targeting those programs is really, really important. And that's where algorithms come in. So if you look at the market estimates for how widely these algorithms are used, it's like the majority of the US population is run through one of these algorithms at some point um, every year. Um, we studied a particular piece of software that is used to make medical decisions for 70 million people um, a year. And, and all these algorithms basically work the same way. So the goal, the very noble goal, is to find patients who are gonna get sick. 
And I think it's important to flag that this is really something we want the healthcare system to be doing. We want it to be proactive. We want it to be reaching out and targeting people who need help um, and, and getting them the assistance they need with their healthcare needs. Um, and so the way the algorithms do this is they look into the future, which is something that algorithms are very good at doing. Um, they um, you know, predict what, how many stars you're going to give something on Netflix. They predict what you're going to order on Amazon. Um, and so they look ahead in this setting and predict someone's future healthcare costs. So um, are they going to end up in the ER and generate costs in the hospital? Um, what kind of medications are they going to need? They put all of that together into one measure, and that is the target variable that the algorithm is trained on. Those predictions are in turn used to target help now. So the algorithm looks ahead. It sees who's going to generate all these healthcare costs uh, in the process of their health spiraling out of control. And it finds those people today so that we can target them with this extra help program. So this all sounds really good. Um, we were interested in the possibility that this algorithm might be biased. And to study racial bias, you have to be very precise about how you're defining it. Um, so here's how we defined it. The algorithm basically generates a score for everyone in a primary care population. So you don't have to come into the hospital, you can be sitting on your couch and the algorithm will generate a score. And that score is gonna determine whether you get prioritized into a fast track that gets you access to this program or if you get screened out of that program. Um, we studied this at one hospital in a big primary care population, but this, as we've worked with more hospitals, it works about the same way almost everyone. So the basic idea is that people with the same score get treated the same. They have the same likelihood of getting into that high risk care management program or not. And so those people should have the same health care needs for those programs, um, the decision that's being based on the algorithm score. The color of their skin should not matter, um, but that's not actually what we found. So um, I'm showing a graph here. I figured since you all were attending a conference at MIT, uh, you could handle a graph, but I am gonna talk through the axes um, the x-axis, the, the horizontal axis, is showing you the algorithm risk score. So imagine everyone just lined up from low risk at the left to high risk at the top. And where that um, uh, vertical dotted line to the right of that is where people get fast tracked into this program. On the y-axis is one measure of health. Now it turns out it doesn't really matter what measure of health you look at, but what we chose here is we looked ahead over the next year and we saw how many times did you have a chronic illness that flared up um, that made you come into the ER or go see your doctor? And we just counted up how many times that happened and used it as our measure of health. Now, what you can see is that the line for black patients, the purple line is well above the line for white patients at any algorithm score. So two people with the same algorithm score, the black patient is gonna go on to be less healthy over that next year. How much less healthy? Well, let me tell you one fact about this fast track group, the people who got preferential access to this high risk care management program. Um, when we studied this uh, algorithm in this program, that fast track was 18% black. And you might think that relative to the base rate of the population, which was 12% black, the algorithm was doing a great job. Black patients were 50% overrepresented. So you might've stopped there and said, well, um, this algorithm looks good, no bias. When we statistically simulated what fraction of that fast track should have been black um, based on this variable, based on their future healthcare needs, that program should have been almost half black. And so relying on these simple rules to judge the amount of bias in an algorithm relative to population base rate, for example, can be very misleading. So we were very interested in understanding where the algorithm went wrong. And an important part of that was understanding where the algorithm went right. So now I'm showing you a similar graph, um, same algorithm score on the x-axis, but now on the y-axis, I'm showing you not health, but cost. How much, how many dollars did these patients go on to generate in costs over that next year? And now you can see that everything's going very well. The algorithm is predicting costs very well, and it's predicting it equally well for black and white patients. Those lines are right on top of each other. So again, you might've thought, oh, look, the algorithm is predicting the same thing. Um, the same thing goes up goes on to happen to black and white patients, how could this algorithm be biased? The reason it's biased is because it's biased for health, not for cost. Black patients and white patients don't have the same relationship between health and cost. White patients have on average better access to the healthcare system so that when they feel a squeezing sensation in their chest, when they're sitting on their couch, they're more likely to call the ambulance and end up in the ER and get their heart attack diagnosed than a black patient 
and that generates costs and it doesn't for the black patient. In addition, the health system just treats black patients differently um, as, as we know from a number of studies, um, including um, the ones that Amaka reviewed. So the result of all of this is that at the same level of health, black patients on average generate lower costs that reflect those structural barriers and that disparate treatment. And so if you train an algorithm to predict cost accurately, you will also train it to be biased in its prediction of health. Now notice that here, unlike in some other settings, this is not at all a problem of whether we're adjusting for race or not. In fact, the makers of this particular algorithm did not allow it to use the race variable. Race exerted its influence by depressing the cost variable that the algorithm was trained to predict, um, not through any explicit um, adjustment. It was the way in which we train the algorithm on a variable called cost rather than health. So in closing, let me just tell you a couple of lessons that we took away um, from this process. The first is that getting that target variable right matters an enormous amount. And that's not just true in health. That's true in criminal justice, where we're often interested in the likelihood that someone is going to reoffend or commit a crime. But we don't have a variable called likely to commit a crime. We have a variable called arrested for a crime or convicted by a jury for a crime. And those are very different, and that can introduce a lot of bias. Similarly, in employment, we use employee you know, ratings that people give other employees. In finance, we use income. And all of those algorithms trained on those variables um, can introduce bias. That said, what we've also found is that many biased algorithms are fixable. And it all stems from understanding what is the right target variable. So in our case, we worked with the developer of that biased algorithm to retrain the algorithm to predict not cost, but a basket of measures related to the patient's health. And when we did that, we generated a new algorithm that had 84% less bias on one measure. Um, We've used some of the attention we got from that initial study to establish a number of collaborations with health systems, with um, payers, with tech companies building algorithms, um, and with regulators at the state and federal level. And that process has uncovered a lot of biased algorithms, but in every case, we've been able to start working towards a solution to retrain those algorithms on metrics that are much, much closer to patient outcomes, um, and in so doing, dramatically reduce the bias. Um, and I wanted to say that if you guys are working in settings where you're concerned that algorithms might be biased um, and, and are being deployed um, for patient care or for anything else, um, please get in touch with us. We would love to talk about a collaboration. Um, you can email me or uh, tweet at me or whatever you wanna do. Um, the last thing I wanted to end on was, a, was another optimistic note, which is that um, getting that target variable right can actually dramatically turn algorithms around. So you'll notice that the original algorithm we studied was predicting cost and then allocating extra help to people who were already generating costs. That's a fundamentally regressive thing to do. It's, it's giving an extra resource preferentially to people who already have resources just like it. But by retraining the algorithm on health instead of cost, we can transform that algorithm into a tool for justice, a tool that gets resources to people who need help, um, not people who already have it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Obermeyer. And we have a whole half hour now for our panel discussion uh, with uh, Dr. Barber and Dr. Inanya. And, and I'm going to, with your permission, switch to first names because I want this to be conversational. I want all of us to talk to each other as well as um, you know, take some questions from the audience. So everybody, the Q&A function is open. I see some questions have already come in. But let me start uh, with you. Well, with everybody, you know, COVID has hit us really hard. So uh, Sherelle began her presentation talking about COVID and Ziad, what, where's their optimism in terms of using and what mistakes have we already made on the COVID inequities? We have seen inequities in terms of health, who's getting sick and who's dying and who's getting the vaccine. But I think you've done some writing also around uh, inequities on who's getting the support from the government. So can I ask you to, to kick us off with that? Yeah, um, thanks, Natalia. So we published an article in JAMA um, uh, last year that was looking at bias in the way that the federal government was allocating um, $175 billion of relief to hospitals. 
um, for, for COVID. And the point of this funding was to help hospitals care for patients with COVID and also to offset some of the huge financial losses that those hospitals were experiencing because of the decrease in patient volumes and elective surgeries. So, um, you know, keeping the doors open was a really important consideration. Um, and so Congress passes the law. And so that's our kind of, that's our, our guiding light, um, help hospitals who need help. Um, now, the way that was implemented was a way that reminded me a lot of our work on biased algorithms, because the way that funding was distributed to hospitals was proportional, not to some measure of need related to COVID or, or financial need. Um, it was proportional to the hospital's revenue pre-COVID. Um, and so what that did was that um, a lot of funding went to places that didn't really have bad COVID. A lot of places with a lot of COVID um, uh, didn't get the funding they needed. Um, and it was the, the mismatch was so great that a bunch of hospitals actually gave money back to the federal government, which, and that doesn't, you know, usually money only flows one way in that direction, it doesn't flow back. Um, and so as a testament to the mismatch, but more concerningly, um, that was that disparity happened along very racial lines. And so black counties were disproportionately much less favored by that formula um, because they serve patients who have less access, less insurance, um, whose heart attacks are diagnosed less often. Um, and so it missed its mark um, and it exacerbated the very inequalities that we were becoming conscious of over the course of the pandemic. Um, and it was all because of that choice of metric of how to distribute the need. And so I think that the lessons that we're starting to learn from algorithms around getting the right target variable have a lot of lessons for um, healthcare policy as well. Now, as usual, I'll just end on an optimistic note, which is that um, you know, I, I uh, was working a few times in the emergency department um, during COVID. Um, and one of the dilemmas for um, emergency providers was who do I send home and who do I um, bring into the hospital. That triage decision was really, really hard. And there were a lot of stories of patients being sent home um, and, and needing a breathing tube three days later um, because the physician had misestimated severity. Um, and so actually with um, uh, Alexander Madri here at MIT and some other colleagues, we're building an algorithm that reads chest x-rays from the ER and tries to help the physician with that forecast. So I think, you know, like everywhere, algorithms are a tool um, and tools can be used for good or, or for evil. And um, it's up to us to decide which one it is. Thanks. Amaka, can I turn to you? Because you're also, you know, a clinician and, and that sort of, you know, your personal gut versus the tools that you use. Can you speak a little bit, whether in nephrology or beyond, or if you were involved in the COVID response, you know, how do you get that right? Um, and, and what can you rely on? Yeah, great question. Um, so yes, I was involved in the, in the COVID response. Um, patients with renal disease are particularly at high risk of, of developing COVID-19. Um, so I did get to see firsthand um, patients in the ICU. It's a devastating um, disease and that's all I can say. Um, but I would say that I'm also, I've also been very uh, in my role, my new director role of health equity and anti-racism in the division, as well as uh, some committee work in the Department of Medicine, um, are really involved with uh, addressing uh, racial disparities in vaccine uptake, uh, not only among um, hospital staff, but in the community. And I think the largest theme that I could say that's come out for, for both efforts would be in the hospital or in the surrounding community is meeting people where they are at. Um, we had a, a really successful effort. Um, we called it caveat, which was a, a bunch of very concerned um, black and brown physicians who saw that the vaccine uptake rate of, among employees was, was threefold higher among white individuals compared to other racial groups. And in particular for black employees, it was like less than 5%. Five, 5 it was very, very small. We went to staff huddles. Um, we had uh, PowerPoints that looped around the hospital. We had stickers. We, uh, it, the, and the huddles were specifically to black physicians that were going, right, and answer, doing Q&A and, and getting information out. There was a lot of misinformation. A lot of employees had been affected by COVID-19 by them, themselves or their family members. Um, and that was incredibly helpful to have that trust and to have that information right there. And then the same thing, we have uh, volunteer vaccination clinics that I've been a part of that uh, we go to uh, black neighborhoods in West Philadelphia. We've so far vaccinated over 3000 individuals, 85% of those individuals have been black. And again, meeting people where they're at, not having internet sign up, having mobile texting sign up, um, knowing that there are disparities in, um, in technology. Pew Research has published on this extensively for years, and we know that. And so not really you know, 
relying on internet signups or things like that, or people don't have access to those same technologies has been extremely effective. Thanks, Amaka. And Sherelle, I'm going to throw back a question that you posed to the group in your slides, which, you know, how do we avoid this tendency towards high-tech solutions that often replace these high-touch solutions? And, and this, exactly what Amaka was talking to, and, and, and where do you think we need to bring technology more in? Exactly. No, I think, I mean, I, got, I actually got that from one of my mentors, Dr. Giselle Corby-Smith, who, you know, has been talking about these uh, inequities in COVID-19, but especially in vaccines. And what we've found is, Dr. Um, that Amaka has just said, is that we can't totally rely on technology, right? And so what is, what do we, and we, we do have to continue to, quote unquote, touch uh, communities, especially those who've been most harmed by these structures and systems of oppression. And so, you know, one of my, what, what I think we need, just need to be thinking about is, you know, where do we use technology to be a tool of justice, as, as Ziad has said, but making sure that we don't replace some of the very neat, the very, uh, the necessity to continue to be in community with, with the most marginalized, you know, uh, uh, places in our society. Um, and I've been in a number of calls, um, you know, through this vaccine distribution with community members, and they just wanted information about the vaccine. They had very real and valid questions that they needed someone, a person to actually <laughs> answer for them. You know, it was questions like, Will the vaccine interact with my hypertension medications or my diabetes medications, right? And so we don't want to fully replace, right, the, 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 the need for people to interact with humans and, and individuals and trusted, you know, thought leaders and, and, and leaders in the medical field. We don't want to replace um, that with, you know, just technology. And I think that's where we've, we've got to just really do some thinking about how we incorporate technology where it's helpful, but also don't get rid of the ways in which we you know, um, come quote unquote virtually face to face with with communities um, and addressing their needs. And so I've seen that happen um, here in Philadelphia um, with the Black Doctors Consortium, the, their phenomenal work um, where they've, you know, targeted some of the most the hardest hit communities and again have been there present in communities to help people one understand the vaccine, but also, you know, get them the, the, the vaccine, you know, that they need. And so I think all of that is really important as we address these issues. Thanks so much. And I'm going to go to some of the questions from the audience. There's been a few people asking us, you know, how do we eliminate data bias since AI is so heavily dependent on data? And, and what is the data? What are we, how are we operationalizing race? Is it self-reported? Can, can some people speak to how you've used race, how you've seen race? And I don't know, if you want to speak to Rhea Boyd's recent call for how we should use race in, in, in studies, but who, who wants to go first? Go ahead, Sherelle. So uh, what I'll say is that, you know, we, we have to think about what that variable really is. And really, it's a marker of structural racism, right? Like it is not biological, it's not genetic. And we've been saying that over and over and over again. And so, you know, the so when you insert race into these, these equations or algorithms, you're inserting those structures and systems in some ways. And I think we just have to, you know, take that into consideration. And perhaps there are ways in which we um, actually measure the things that we're, we want to get at. So, you know, I think that, you know, going back to the work that I do around place and health, um, zip code could potentially be, you know, um, a, a very real marker of structural racism uh, that could be used, but it could also be leveraged in a, in a negative way, right? And so, again, we have to think about what we're actually trying to get at when we're talking about race. Is it the lived experiences? Is it experiences of discrimination? Is it the structural racism? And so, and then how that shows up and operates in the algorithm. But I'm not a computer scientist, so I'll, I'll pass it on to Ziad or Amaka, Amaka excuse me, um, to, to also answer. Zia, jump in. Where uh, I, th I think you're the one who probably I'm not making this assumption plays around with actually doing this. So we'd love to hear how you're day to day and and if you've used different ways of like race differently in different scenarios. I think um, you know I had this one um, great discussion with someone who works in criminal justice that I wanted to share because it shows how kind of like complex this can be. So imagine hypothetically that there's a city where um, two people commit the same crime. Um, and the white person is, is more likely to be charged with assault and the black person is more likely to be charged with aggravated assault. So there's some bias in the data process and that's um, as a function of how, for example, the officer um, or, or the, the criminal justice system perceives the race of that person. 
Now let's say we're trying to figure out, okay, um, these two people are um, before a judge and we need to figure out their likelihood of reappearing for bail or not. Um, if the algorithm isn't able to see that person's race, um, the algorithm is not going to be able to see that this aggravated thing is meaningless. So it was, it's going to actually discriminate against the black defendant if it's not able to use race. On the other hand, there are lots of places where race can play this very pernicious role. In so all of these variables, it's, it's complicated. There's no one rule of thumb that's going to get us an unbiased algorithm because these things are extremely complicated. We have a um, reaction against, for example, using LinkedIn data um, for credit scoring. But in fact, LinkedIn data can be very powerful. It can help us identify people who are gonna be very reliable in paying back their loans and get that person a lower interest rate, um, even if they live in a zip code uh, or an area um, that has on average bad loan repayment rates. So the data can be used for good or, or they can be used for, for not good. And it just depends on these subtle technical choices when we're building the algorithm. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is that I think that um, there's one way in which I think that um, the more data we have and the more sophisticated algorithms we have is going to be very positive, um, which is that the more data we have on someone about their real health status. Um, so, you know, not using race as a stand in for something else, um, but the more data we have on their actual heart function from a wearable monitor that doesn't depend on a doctor diagnosing their heart problem, the more we have this direct line to patients, the less that race variable is actually going to matter. Um, in these models, because race is ultimately, you know, as everyone has said, we're not talking about a genetic thing. That's like a biological, you know, um, uh, arrow going from your genes to some outcome. These things are all these deep social problems. And the more we start measuring things about those social problems, about the health consequences of those problems, um, the more we're going to be able to target our interventions to those root causes, um, rather than playing around with this variable that's just a stand in for all of these other things in a complex way. Thanks, Siad. And thank you for bringing up the criminal legal system. You know, when I, I worked briefly as a science advisor to the New York City Health Commissioner, Dr. Mary Bassett, and the the sort of the police department and the they were thinking about using predictive AI to say who who was homeless and had mental health challenges would be a risk to society and should be followed by the police. She was very much worried and very, very adamant that we could not be using predictive because the bias, you know, we were just being black was automatically putting you on a scale of, of being more at risk. And it was just, she was very, very worried as health commissioner about the risks. And I think that goes back to Amaka, like these decisions aren't trivial. They're not, they're, they mean something to the patient. It means not getting your um, kidney, not getting on a transplant list. So Amaka, do you want to speak a little bit to how you have spoken about this? I know you've been, you, you know, you wrote a really great piece that was, you know, in 2019 that has really, you know, but I've seen you on TV interviews, like how do people take to this perspective that, you know, and, and how do you convince them that it's not biological and that there is a real risk? I don't think I've convinced anyone. Uh, I, I think that people are, are very set in their ways because as I showed you the data that there were there were some their observations that there were some differences in this biological biomarker um, between blacks and whites in and not one but a few EGFR equation studies. I think the issue and I've written about this as well is that if we're if we're going to talk about a population health study then the individuals in those studies should be representative of the population. And I think that if, if most people have not done as, as deep of a dive as I have for these studies, but if you look at, for instance, the CKD epi study, 70% um, of the black participants came from another trial called the ASK trial. Everybody was 100% black in that trial. It was focused on the effect of blood uh, pressure control on hypertensive kidney disease. If you look at the baseline characteristics of, of patients in the ASK trial, 50%, um, close to 50% were had an income of less than 15,000. 40% um, had not graduated high school. If you look at US Census Bureau reports, Pew Research Center uh, reports on income, that did not match the US population at the time that the CKD epi study was published. Now, if we think about the things that definitively affect creatinine, muscle mass, uh, diet. So, you know, should I be treated the same way as someone who has a, a ton of privilege 
um, compared to someone who, who does not, right? How is my diet different? How is my, my occupation different in terms of me doing a lot of manual labor, for instance? None of these things that we know for a fact can affect serum creatinine levels um, were uh, implicated in the study. So to Ziad's point, we need more, inf the more information, the better, because guess what? Racial groups are not monolithic. And I think, you know, part of the problem, and I've been trying to work with the NIH about this, is that even for our NIH progress reports, or when you're submitting your grant, the, um, the assumption is that when you report your, your recruitment, it's just very like number of black people, number of Asian people, number of white people, when we should really be thinking about the things as we know, we've discussed multiple times that really track along racial lines, which are the effects of structural racism. So within those NIH tables, we should have income for uh, all of the black individuals we recruited or white individuals. We should have level of education. We should have perhaps um, area regional um, um, information as well. So we can really work on being on, on generalizability for a population uh, health study. We should not accept anymore that population health means that we have a large number of minorities, which is really the pushback when I speak about this EGFR um, controversy. And can I add something um, there? Because I do work with the, I'm the social determinants of health culture for the Jackson Heart Study which has been done a phenomenal job of showing the heterogeneity within the black population, even in a, a cohort of blacks from Jackson, Mississippi, right? And so I do, speaking to your point, I think it's really important that we think about um, actually measuring some of those other markers that aren't race. Um, and again, gleaning the heterogeneity that exists within, within the black population. I did get a question from the audience, if we have any pediatric population examples, and I only know about pain, sort of pain medicine and differences, but that were prescribed that, that black children are less likely. There was a study on, on children that had uh, appendicitis and there was less pain management for black children, but I'm not a pediatrician. Is anyone here aware either on pediatric population inequities through algorithms or are you, Ziad, doing anything with pediatric health related? No, I, I have no expertise on this, sorry. That's okay. We have an amazingly uh, competent panel, so we don't need to touch on pediatrics, but somebody did push back a little bit and they said, I don't believe AI and or data sets are fundamentally racist. Maybe the programmers of the AI technology and the owners of the data are possibly engaging in racist practices, but by no means am I calling these individuals racist. And I know Ziad, you were trying to type an answer, uh, but I think it is worth talking about. We have hundreds of participants with us today who joined us today because they want to do better. They are computer scientists. They are, uh, and, and I am excited. So I do not want to be discouraging anyone uh, by us calling out some of the critiques. So what can they do uh, intentionally, explicitly from the beginning? Ziad. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, what, what I've tried to do in, in, um, in my thinking and, and what's come out of a lot of our work is really try to figure out, you know, um, what are the very specific ways in which racism can, can get into a data set and into an algorithm. Um, and so the, you know, as, as I was just frantically typing the, the example that, um, that I wanted to highlight from, um, from my, um, the, the work I presented earlier was, uh, and, and there are many examples that um, Sherelle Alan and, and Amaka cited as well, is the way we measure variables um, has a lot of um, uh, racial differences. So for example, um, someone who has a heart attack because of, you know, uh, bad experience with, with the medical system, fear of being hit with a bill for an ambulance, um, bad experience in the ER last time, that heart attack is gonna be less likely to be diagnosed um, in a black patient than a white patient. And that's not a, con that's not a controversial statement. I think if you look at rates of you know, silent or undiagnosed MIs, it's just much higher in marginalized populations. And so now I have this variable that I'm interested in, heart attack, but the measurement process contains this bias, which means that in my data set, I'm less likely to observe that heart attack in a black patient than a white patient. And so that is a very general phenomenon. That's the thing that's underlying the cost differences um, at a given level of health that we saw in our study. Um, it affects a lot of other things. And I think that's just one of many ways in which um, uh, the, the measurement process is a, is a huge um, source of bias. Um, I also wanted to say in response to the second part of your question, we, you know, from, from the first time we started working with the company that 
um, developed the algorithm that we studied through all of our collaborations um, with, with companies that were, um, and, and not just companies, with um, governmental agencies or um, nonprofit health systems that are using algorithms that encode racial bias. Every single person we've worked with, um, a selected sample, I know, but, but one that's been really, really willing to engage with these issues, um, to uh, acknowledge the racism that was embodied in these algorithms and, and to try to fix the problem. And so, you know, it could be that people are just really great actors, but, you know, I, I don't think that this is a story about people being racist or, or even companies being implicitly racist by putting profits before people. I think there's just like these very subtle things in data and algorithms that end up having huge, huge consequences, um, not just in algorithms, but, but also in the funding allocation schemes. Um, and I think that right now, what we need to do is fix those problems. Um, and, and I think that acknowledging them is the first part of that solution. I, I just want to jump in and, and, and do tack on that. Um, not everybody feels that way. I, I think we're all preaching to the choir, maybe even in this audience. Um, but there are many, many people, very, very educated people that say um, there, are, there are inherent biological differences and maybe it's not race, maybe it's ancestry. Um, and so, you know, I've heard that plenty of, to this day, I've heard this plenty of times when we're talking about race and EGFR. So although, as you're saying, Zia, I don't think anyone has, um, you know, just their, their intentions may not be racist, but the beliefs that have been taught for decades, which stem from, as Dr. Barbara, call, uh, Dr. Barbara covered very eloquently, from racist practices, they're still being unlearned. Um, and so I think conferences like this are excellent in really just naming it um, and really moving forward to push past this and being mindful at every step of the research study from the design to the recruitment to the analysis and keeping, and Dr. Boyd covered this in her piece, keeping the structural racism piece front and center when we're talking about race. It is not ancestry. It is not something that is inherent that we are born with. Um, I do think that that's important to note. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just add to that. I think that's why, again, this very deep and explicit analysis of how structural racism becomes quote unquote embodied and how it shows up. And, you know, I gave the example of racial residential segregation, but there's so many other examples of how it shows up, but we don't even have that basic knowledge and understanding of these mechanisms. We, we're, we kind of become ahistorical in our analysis of these issues. So a couple of things that I would say is that, you know, as we're developing these applications within healthcare, you know, having transdisciplinary teams that include sociologists, that include, you know, folks from the criminal legal system, that include, you know, a wide range of expertise so that, again, your even the, the blind spots that you have because of your field, for example, don't come into play when developing, developing these. Um, I think there's some great resources by folks like Ruha Benjamin, uh, who's the author of the new Jim Code, um, as well as Data for Black Lives who also, again, are, are at the forefront and pioneering kind of how, the ideas about how we use data um, and how we don't use it to harm as opposed, you know, as opposed to help. And I think, you know, uh, looking at those resources um, and, and, and really, you know, um, doing some self-critique um, of, you know, how we're, you know, operationalizing these, these things within the healthcare system. Because, it, you know, that, all of that, you know, doing the thoughtful, thoughtful, or the thinking ahead of time, right? Before we get started and just acknowledging, you know, your own blind spots, I think goes a long way, right? To, to get us to a place where these, you know, AI tools could potentially become tools for justice and not tools for, you know, to, to kind of exacerbate uh, systems of oppression. So that's, you know, those are things that I would add. And I also do want to add that if there is something, so I'll just use race and issues as far as an example. If you have another alternative that does not use race and does not have this bias that's embedded into it, then use it. So we have Sistan C. We have a biomarker that performs just as well as creatinine. There's been multiple studies to show that. Why are we not using that? You know, is, is, is a question like that. So I've been on some, some, um, some collaborations where ADI, for instance, works just as well as race in, in a kind of a, an AI algorithm, then use ADI. You know, I think that the, if we have an alternative um, and that can, that can be, that can perform just as well in this algorithm or equation, we should use it by all means. And I, I don't understand um, a lot of the pushback 
for doing that uh, if we had them and they perform just as well. We got one more question that asked about uh, other countries, a comparative lens, you know, countries that are diverse, whether we're talking about Canada, France, Brazil, um, and, and what are we seeing? And, and I do want to say to Amaka's point, you know, at the individual level, how you're coding someone or, or a system might be different from what we're saying at the population level. You know, for, for public health epidemiologists, for example, COVID, the fact that France didn't want to talk about race and COVID means that it becomes invisible. You know, the US has been really at the forefront in showing that inequities in COVID rates of death, but around the world, we're not finding that disaggregated data. So some, in some ways, talk, showing race as structural racism and, and you know, being able to say that structural racism is leading to COVID-19 inequities, not only in the US, but also in Brazil and other places is really important. And allowing for that to be invisible, I think Ziad, you sort of talked about that too, has, has its own risks. Sherelle, do you wanna speak? I know you have done work in Brazil. Do you wanna speak a little bit about how you, how this, this conversation might be relevant globally? Absolutely. You know, Brazil, you know, um, for those of you who are not familiar with their racial scheme, it's on a, a racial a continuum, right? So you have this Black, mixed race, uh, white, Asian, and indigenous kind of cater formal categorizations of race. Um, but that mixed race uh, is, is very fluid. One, it can change over a person's life course. So people self, how people self-identify can change or how people are perceived can change depending on, you know, what region of the country you're in, for example. So this, you know, I think um, speaks to the need, again, not to just use race, right, as the variable, but again, out measuring those very real manifestations of structural racism. And we'll, you'll, we'll have to think and think about how, you know, these algorithms play out in different racialized societies because it won't be exactly the same as the U.S. So, you know, that's what I would say is that, again, you have to give thought to it. You have to, you know, have that historical perspective. You have to bring in, you know, a group of, of people who understand how race op is operationalized and manifests in, um, in certain societies um, for us, you know, as we're beginning to, you know, have applications of AI in other, other, other contexts. I, I could... I can speak to race and Niger far internationally. So um, they have specifically to black individuals have looked at the the how much the black race coefficient adds to statistical accuracy among South Africans, among Ghanaians, um, and it does not add anything. In fact, the South the South African renal um, guidelines say do not use the black race coefficient to predict. Um, to in the EGFR equation. And for the people who think that it's all ancestry, um, you would think that if in, in West Africa, for instance, um, if, if there's, if that would, for instance, predict uh, GFR just as well, but it doesn't. So, you know, again, I think what you're saying, Dr. Barber, is in, in, incredibly important. And we can't put these in guidelines. What, what do I do as a clinician? How do I treat an, uh, someone who is immigrated from Ghana or South Africa who's Black? Because again, I'm just giving them a blanket generalization of, on how I should treat them for their kidney disease. We don't have any guidelines for that. So therefore, it's, it's flawed. It's not an accurate practice at all. I'm conscious that we are coming to an end of this conversation. I'm gonna give everybody a chance to sort of summarize your thoughts. I do wanna pull out a comment that was recently made that you know, different populations um, face vulnerability, whether we're talking about rural, urban. Uh, we've been focusing on racial inequities in our panel this morning, but we could have had this conversation where we were talking about gender and sex and when we use which, uh, whether we're talking about other um, dimensions of sort of discrimination and exclusion and marginalization. So uh, for this context, this is tremendously important, but you should be able to make parallels and, and draw conclusions that would apply to other groups that are excluded, discriminated, and could be harmed by AI. So in closing, everybody gets one minute to summarize, you know, a key message to people who want to do better in this field. Um, let's start with uh, you, Ziad. You're going to go alphabetical order by first name, and I was safe. Um, I, I wanted to highlight um, one uh, one study I didn't get a chance to talk about um, that, that we did, because I think it ties together a few of the themes, and it's about um, knee pain. And I just um, answered a question and posted a link to it in the chat. Um, so the standard machine learning playbook in health is to get, for example, a bunch of x-rays um, and train the algorithm to tell us what the radiologist would say about that x-ray. Um, and um, one of the things that um, you might worry about is that that knowledge could be biased. And so this, I think, goes to Amako's point that 
you know, some of these biases run very, very deep. They're built into kind of the DNA of medical knowledge, like which lab we use, um, how we interpret this lab value. Um, and so I think that a lot of that playbook by reproducing um, doctor's judgment runs the risk of automating all of those deep biases um, in, in medicine. And so I wanted to uh, mention this because I think it, what we did is we trained an algorithm not to predict what the doctor said about the patient's knee, um, but to predict what um, the patient said about their knee, how much pain was that patient in? So this is a, a measure that was collected directly from the patient um, uh, that, that I think is really promising because it doesn't depend on a doctor um, to view the patient as an object. It gives that um, patient um, the ability to be her own subject and, and to say what she feels about um, her knee. And what we found in that study is that taking that approach dramatically reduced um, the unexplained pain that Black patients feel that was over and above the severity of how bad their knee looked on that x-ray. Um, and I think that highlights some of these biases. So the way we um, know about knee arthritis is because doctors were looking at coal miners in England in the 1950s who were all white and all male. So it wasn't necessarily anyone's fault, except we haven't updated that knowledge to reflect the kinds of populations that um, we're currently seeing. So I think algorithms can really help expose those kinds of biases and knowledge and push the frontier forward and show where we need more data and, and more study. Thanks so much, Sied. Cheryl. No, it's just, um, you know, one, thank you for uh, um, inviting me to be a part of this panel. I've learned a lot actually this morning. And so thank you to Ziad and Amika for your amazing work. Um, one of the things that I also, you know, just say is that we, you know, as we wrestle and contend with these issues, just again, taking into real account the complexity of how these inequities arise um, and not losing sight of the human centered nature of this work again. So again, I would just stress that as we, advance in our technology, advance in you know, the applications of AI, that we do not miss or um, exclude the very real and lived experiences of individuals and we balance our you know, push for technology with you know, the, the human-centered approaches that's still needed within the healthcare system. Um, and then finally, that we, you know, along with these advancements in AI, don't lose sight of the real structural issues that we also have to address in tandem with you know, these advancements and, and within the healthcare system. So all of those factors outside of the healthcare system, right, that really are the drivers fundamental to racial health inequities, um, economic, socioeconomic health inequities, you know, not ignoring those, you know, for this shiny new toy, for example, within healthcare. Thanks. And Dr. Inanya, you close us out. Sure, I want to echo. First of all, thank you for the invitation, and uh, so so exciting to present with these brilliant colleagues. I would echo everything that everyone has said, and just to add, you know that at the center of this are our patients, our our people, um, and the amount of hurt that I've seen in the Black community with them learning about race and EGFR is profound. So we had the, we had tools um, a few decades ago that were limited. We have better tools now. Let's use them. We have better knowledge, and we have experts. Dr. Barber co commented this on, on this before. We all can't be experts. I can't do what Siad does. Um, but if I were to do something like that, I would email him or call him. You know, so we have people who are experts in health equity and anti-racism. Um, bring them on board when you're doing this work, right? Work collaborative to, collaboratively together. And that's how we'll have better science to learn from lessons in the past to not perpetuate these biases any longer. So I would say be collaborative bring the actual experts that have been studying this for decades at some time, some point um, onto your team and so we can uh, do better for our patients. Thank you all so much.